And scale becomes really key because the processes, even though we talk about something called economic processes, what are they? What are social processes? They operate quite differently at different scales. And I suspect one of the things, if you're arguing what location, that location matters, make sure you take, say, well, what location are you talking about and why does it matter? What's the role of scale within this? So teachers, you may want to frame which scales you pick because there's many different scales and an unlimited amount that you could speak about. So instead we've brought it together. Global, local, nexus. And we argue that the local is embedded in the global. You cannot understand the global processes without understanding the local transformations. So the global shapes our understanding of this local and vice versa. And we are concerned about this. Because in many ways, many of the processes that we imagine, are who are these global citizens, many of whom who are global citizens in particular, that tend to be the very wealthy, who have no problem travelling through any passport and to any place, because who can actually be global? Many people are either financially strapped or they can't necessarily enter spaces easily. Okay, so only certain people have that freedom. Some people, as in this cartoon here, are involuntary global citizens. They're literally without a state, and there are people without place. It's all start of it. So there's three ways we can think about this global local nexus. Firstly, it's a mosaic. What do we mean by a mosaic is the world is a collection of different people and different places. So the imagery is sort of imagined as a mosaic, okay, where each piece is part of a wider pattern. So you would look at the various parts. So what might be an example of a mosaic? Well, in Auckland, you might talk about east, west, north and south, okay? You might talk about different nations next to each other as an example of a mosaic. Or within cities, you could talk about different um, characteristics of different parts of the city. Now, the image you're looking at here, there's actually a link through to the New York Times, which looks at, it's now being required that local cities have to identify segregation within their city. And this is an interactive map of New York. If you click on any of those buttons, it actually gives a census breakdown. Linked to this, is also every single city, large city in the United States in that article. So if you want a really awesome resource around segregation, that will be great for you if you want an example of that. So there's three key features of it. Okay, one, that, one is about boundaries and borders. So here you might have a boundary of the United States, which is in a global sense. And here it's closer up, you've got your borders and you've got your state-based borders. So boundaries and borders, it's one thing. Then you might have, within those boundaries and borders, what's distinct about the place you're talking about? Um, does it have any unique um, characteristics, personalities, and traditions? So I've chosen three here for the United States. Memorial Day, um, 4th of July, and um, Thanksgiving, okay? And you'll talk about what's included within this. Now, what's really key within this is also hidden voices, because often what's commemorated is the dominant group. There'll be things that you can't see within those. Um, the third part of understanding a mosaic is that always within that mosaic, if you've got boundaries and borders, it's the idea that they're not permeable and actually what's a th there's a potential threat to those from outside of those borders. So often an example might be an economic threat, for example. You might use the China trade wars as an example of currently and, and Trump's tariffs on China. I should actually rephrase it. Don't talk about China trade wars. That's definitely not what's happened. Trump's arbitrary tariffs on China would be a better way to phrase that. <laughs> um, so instead, um, I've used migration here as an example. Um, so two examples for you, the so-called border wall as an example of a mosaic and, and really the enforcement of that mosaic but also um, Trump's so-called Muslim ban, and they'd be two examples of that. Okay. So what other threats could you talk about um, in terms of location? Because location, it's that sense of well, meaningful places, and if it's meaningful, therefore it, can't necess it doesn't necessarily change. And, and what might threaten it? Well, one of it is global culture. So the, what's been referred to as the McDonaldization of society. Now, that's not just about the food, okay, by the way, that's about economic practices, that's about labour practices, that's about social practices, a variety of things. So when you, if you're thinking of using that as a metaphor for your teaching, make sure you look more widely than just food, it's much more than that. Um, the image I've got here is also of um, 
Language can be threatened. Um, English language in particular is very much becoming a dominant language within a number of nations, and so local cultures might be left. And this is one here for a French cartoon really saying that Papa is going because, of course, Daddy becomes ubiquitous in the French language, which means the loss of their language. But also this idea here of this placelessness, that you go to all these spaces. I always worry about that when I, I travel overseas and I see not worry, but it always it makes me smile actually because people go to these places that are so different from where they've come from and then they sit at McDonald's. So why would you do that? But um, so be it. Uh, other threats, <clears throat> often the, glo the reason we talk about the local is the global is seen as quite threatening, particularly in terms of economy. Because as I've indicated to you, money's mobile, people are less so. So if the money moves out of an area, people are often with left within that area. Um, you might get the standardisation of goods and practices. So many businesses or local businesses are driven out of um, business. So this one is an image of Walmart taking over the world. Some of you will have seen last night that Costco is coming to New Zealand. That would be another example of when practices, this will have real ramifications. Now it may mean cheaper goods, but it also may mean lower wages and a whole bunch of other practices with it. Um, but we won't talk about that. Um, just here, but you may want to pick up about it, and it's something for teachers. I'd write down this term, spatial division of labour. That's one of the terms that's really attached to these thinkings. Um, you've also got, uh, this one here is about where, where um, the economies are connected and that people are interconnected, but there is an unfair distribution of um, the effects of, some, the negative effects of, or externalities of some of these practices. So one here, the sweatshops, which make our many pairs of shoes, um, uh, so this one here, obviously, she's long hours of work, no shoes, yet this one's got no job, but has got the shoes. So this idea of, yes, we are connected, but what does this actually mean? How do we tease this out locally? It has lots of impacts on the local. Uh, just as an example, um, East Africa, a number of nations, this is from this year, they tried to ban second-hand clothing. Now you might think this is incredibly weird. Why would you ban second-hand clothing? But what was happening was, Basically, places like the United States were bringing large amounts of container fulls of second-hand clothing and driving out all the local producers. So it arrived, they'd, they'd open up and they'd offload all this cheaply subsidised um, material. Interestingly, um, they were stopped from actually banning it because of tariffs. So if you want to have a look at some of those interconnections. This is just an example here of Carnell Markets. Also this idea is that there is some pushback. Local people organising, is there a way we can buy locally? Um, not just for ethical reasons, but also environmental reasons um, and social reasons. So you have a mosaic. So the local and the global are connected through a mosaic, bits of pieces. But is it enough just to describe them as separate pieces on a jigsaw puzzle? Or is it a system? So one of the ways they've thought about it is local differences are produced externally to the local. So many of the processes external to our place create us. So places are not just a consequence of our internal aspects, but where you are located. So the image you're looking at here is a good example. So this here, the global system can impact locality one differently from locality two. So I'll give you an example here. Let's say the global system, global car industry, locality one is Detroit, and locality two is really so what they call um, uh, the so-called Sunbelt. Um, so Detroit got shut down with many of its car industry, and you can have a look at that as an example. Most of that moved offshore, or it moved to cities just outside of the US, so for example in Mexico. So different localities are impacted differently based on their position globally and their histories, and that then affects how the local, what happens in the local area. Detroit's a fantastic example if you're going to use it for all of these different themes, okay, if you want an example. Um, also, the argument is, or geographers say, the difference is not innate, it's made systematically. So it doesn't just happen, it's made often externally to places. So I talked, for example, of that clothing ban, for example. Um, the system stopped them from doing it, and the system at this stage was um, Trump refused to have it and put tariffs on many of these nations like Uganda and prevented them from doing this. So the mosaic looks at, um, it looks at the differences between them to explain the differences, whereas the systems-based approach, what are the interconnections that explain it? So this is two cartoons, but for an example, one of the arguments being many um, less developed countries remain less developed because of 
um, external either colonial relations, um, previous slavery relations, which now form the basis of debt, which means most of what they do is actually repaying their debt rather than growth. Okay? So a lot of your answers can't be found locally. They've got to be found in that connection between the two and the um, systems. So this is the work of Jim's Blouse, and he basically said the reason you need to do this is because our world system has been organised around capitalism, which is a global system. And what capitalism did, it was very time specific and enabled many of the more developed countries to get advantages out of colonialism. So one of, I'm just giving you an example here in the last month where two of the most prominent um, Western universities are now investigating how they personally benefited from slavery um, and the monies that it brought. Okay? So a lot of the advantages like people will say, well, why can't these developed countries just did what we do what we did in the West? Well, the problem is the West was based on, like the British Industrial Revolution was brought about because of slavery and the money that they made from slavery, which created the cotton, which enabled um, the various processes that we had. Like I said, so if you think, for example, many of the cultural practices in the UK are actually linked to that history of colonisation. So you think about uh, a cup of tea is so very English. Isn't it? A cup of tea, a little bit of milk, a little bit of sugar. Well, sugar came from slavery. The tea came from colonisation of India, and the milk. Well, that was somewhat local. Okay. So these are very. So lots of the things which we imagine are local are actually connected to a world system. And um, I'll let you read this one on your own. But it's an example of the Philippines, which talks about the fact that the reason Philippines produces coconuts was basically because. The colonizer at the time made them do it, and the first product they produced was um, rigging, and then they produced soap for certain markets. But always they set up an economic system, which means the actual growers made very little money from it. So they're literally in this cycle of debt um, and, um, and beholden to um, the Western powers. So we need to do more than document diversity. We need to look at diversity and, and the processes that create the inequalities that result. So um, at many different scales within this, and this is just one city example of different neighbourhoods. So the final one, and this is where our thinking is now, and I'd better hurry up. Sorry, guys. Finish the next five. Local and global as a set of connections and disconnections. So what do I mean by this? We can instead add I argue that the global local nexus is about networks. So it's not local doing to global or global doing to local. The local is global, okay, and the global is local. Now this might seem quite complex, and I'm definitely going to walk you through it. Something called actor network theory, which you don't need to know, but that's what it is. So. How does this work? Well, this is Doreen Massey, and she argued that we actually have a global sense of place. Even though we live locally, we need to think beyond parochialism or small towns sort of small mindedness. Okay? And actually, argue our localities are actually very global. So, if we look, for example, at how, do our, how, do, how does, for example, being an Aucklander connect to other places? So, Unless you're Nati Fatua, and even then you were a migrant, okay, we all have histories and complex histories and interrelationships and migrations. Okay. So she argued that places are not containers. So often when we think of a place as their Auckland identity, no, 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 she would say it's actually something new. We're constantly creating something new. So the images I chose to highlight here is a Celtic group um, performing in botany talking about their Scottish heritage, okay, and performing musical history which tied them to not only Auckland, their Aucklanders, but their connection to Scotland. The image you've got on the right, on your right, is an image um, from Chinese New Year at Northcote Shopping Centre, really talking about many Chinese migrants within their place as Aucklanders, okay, so this idea that it's not just simply uh, a local identity which is indigenous which makes up a place, think beyond that. The global, as we think about it as a network, is also about flows. So actor network theory might talk about economic flows of monetary flows, or I'm going to use the example of migrant flows because my specialty is social geography. Economic geography will be the next talk. Um, so if you, they argue in, in, in network, um, local global nexus in terms of network, 
instead of thinking of the globe, you focus on a site. So what might a site might be a place, a location might be Wall Street if you're thinking economically, or Libya. And then you go, you look at that site and you see its connections externally. So trace out how they become globally. So I've chosen Libya for you here. And there's a couple of um, links for you. Now, Libya has become one of the launch points for migrants into Europe. And one of the things that, that they found is you, you can't just look at Libya itself. You've got to look at most of the migrants. Some of them are coming from Syria, but many of them are coming through parts of Africa. And the map you've got at the bottom and the link that you've got is actually a map which takes people through the migrant routes. What are the key reasons why they're migrating? So you start with Libya, you work backwards to work out the space of flows, but you also go forward. And the image you're looking at here on the left is just under 300 migrants for refuge just this week in the Mediterranean, um, coming from Syria, trying to get to Europe. Okay, But you've also got various detention centres in, in, in Libya. So what Europe is trying to do is prevent migrants from getting to Europe. But what they're trying to, the reason, uh, so what's happening is they're providing money for that, but there's lots of examples and lots of scandals around slavery that's emerged and lots of mistreatment of migrants. Um, so you may want to look at this as a case study. Why has Libya become so significant in terms of migrants? It's a complex issue. If you want to understand the importance of location, you need to understand why people came there. So what, is, what, are, the, what are the drivers and where are they going? Why did Libya become the site? And you couldn't do this if you had a global focus. You need to have a local focus too. Otherwise, you only have a generic understanding of migration. So, you learned a lot. More than I thought I had, sorry. Time in my head. Too many, too many case studies. Um, location matters. Did I convince you? Awesome. Geographic location is significant in a global context. That is your scholarship theme. I hope that by the end of this lecture you've got a framing around it about some of the words and the framings you might think about it. Um, local places get their distinctive characteristics from their past, but also their current links into the rest of the world. And I'd probably say actually their future links. How are we intending to grow that? So as a consequence, my final parting shot, we need to create a global sense of the local. Okay? So Think about when we talk about the local, how is that connected globally? Okay, that would be my end of my two cents. Yes. Um, let me just put Mary back up before. And I think that last line 
that Mel just said there was actually that whole idea. But you can see the big picture, the idea for us, or for you rather, is that you can see, have a global sense of the local. And I think that's really what the examiner is looking for. And if you didn't get a scholarship, this is the kind of thing, we'll just flip through this really, really quickly, because I want to really deal with the purple bit next. Students who don't do very well in this exam really don't understand what we call the command words, the instructional words about how to, what are you being asked to do. Um, sometimes they will have um, drawn a diagram that has no relevance whatsoever to the question. Um, you know, Mel showed you this, that, that, that um, picture that had the kind of the world getting smaller, the time space compression. That would be a fantastic diagram to incorporate simply, not exactly with all of the places around the world, but that kind of idea would be the sort of diagram that the examiner, if they're marking your work, would go, oh, I wish they were in my class. Mm -hmm. um, candidates who don't do very well just make those sweeping generalizations. Everyone, oh, I did not say that. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone in Africa is poor or something like that. Um, they copy stuff out of the resource booklet, piles and piles and piles and piles and piles of it. Actually, you know, the examiners and the markers, they can read it for themselves. They want you to be able to take an idea and synthesize it. So to be able to do that. And often the questions are two parts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about just one part questions today. But two part questions, there's do this and this. And sometimes students only do one bit. So I thought we might just, I've just taken this, I think, I, don't write this down. So this is what makes a good scholarship student. They're familiar with the topic. They address the question and answer what is being asked. It's no point, I bet you bottom dollar, most of you have had your teachers write something about, but this is not what I asked you about. Yeah, yeah? I'm sure that's the case. Or that you've written an essay that you wanted to have in the exam. Yeah? I've done that. I bet you every one of the teachers has done that at some stage in their lives. Is that right? Yeah? Um, because actually sometimes you just need to be, just go back to that being resilient and that perseverance idea. So be able to answer the question that's being asked. So I kind of want to spend a little bit about, talking a little bit about this. So the command words are those words, the key words in the question, such as evaluation, justification, discussion, and critical analysis. These are the next step up from level three words. Okay? However, you've actually seen some of these words. So if you've done your research internal, you will have done some evaluation about your research process. If you've done uh, 3.6, which is your current geographic issue, you will have done something about justifying why you've chosen that particular option as your option. Um, and you've, for your externals, you've probably done some analysis. So I put in, in the little handout for you a little bit about, I'll just go back, a little bit about what those words mean, and I'm actually just going to leave that for you to read yourselves. So, I've got three kinds of examples of questions. And I just want to deal with the critical evaluation kind of question, because this is a question where you're asked to um, weigh up evidence, assess the validity of something, and, and if you're justifying, you're making informed judgments. So this is a question that I just made up. I don't know if it's the kind of question that would be asked in the exam, but I wanted to illustrate this idea. So it means critically evaluate the significance of location for the development of different nations. And it's, I want to really just focus in on what do we mean by critically evaluating this situation, and but also about how to actually deal with the question. Because part of the thing that you need to be able to do 
is to be able to unpack the question. So this is kind of a two-part question. One is you're critically evaluating why location is important for the development of some countries around the world and read that as economic development or social development or whatever. And then the second part is justify your answer. Now the examiner wants you to do the two bits. Okay? So it's really important to unpack the question. So to think about, well, what does that actually mean? What does critically evaluate mean? It's the weighing up of the evidence. It's thinking about that. So if you can kind of really nail what the heck the command words are, then actually that is so important for you to be able to do. If you're asked to talk about the significance of something, it's how important is it? <laughs> or what other factors might be important as well? So if I look at this question, I might be thinking, well, how significant is location where something is in terms of its economic development? But there might be something else that was equally important besides its location. There might have been some other stuff that was happening to that country that might have affected whether it grew or not. So it's creating a kind of an argument. That's the thing that we're doing in this exam. If you were asked to talk about different nations, it's this question asks you have to talk about at least two because there's a plural there. Which ones would you choose? And why might you choose those? And what does location mean? Where it is? And all of those things that Mel just talked about. And this justified that actually uh, should go to the word justified. Why are you saying location is important, or why are you not saying this? So if I was writing this essay, I might come down on the side, well, that location is quite important for the development of New Zealand. Or maybe I wouldn't. Yeah? So you come out with an argument, and you stick to that argument and write about it. So the key thing I want you to take away really is, is about really understanding what the question's asking you to do. Having a little bit of a, an idea of what the different words are. Now you have, uh, hopefully you've got an idea around that. I've got two other questions there. What I'd like you to do is to choose one of the other questions. Just with the person sitting next to you, fast and furious, I'm going to give you <coughs> four minutes. I want you to come up with what do you think that question's asking you to do? Go. <laughs> okay, that was a really quick four minutes. Um, I got two questions here. First one, discuss how geographic location restricts or enhances the development of a country. So I've got some friends at the front here who are going to tell me, big loud voices, girls. What actually do you think that question is about? And here's where you answer. <laughs> okay, so how might natural features restrict or enhance the development? So what sort of natural features might restrict or enhance the development of a country? Landlocked, perfect. What else? Mountain ranges. Mountain ranges. Yes. Can we think of another natural factor that might restrict or enhance the development of a country? Coastal. Pardon? Coastal. Yes. Come on, there's something really big. Climate. The climate. What's the climate like? That will actually restrict or enhance the development of a country, right? Now, there'll be some cultural things as well. And it might be about your location in the globe, it might be where your, where your neighbours are, those kinds of things. And now I want to know from you is, what does the word disgust mean? 
Who can tell me what the word disgust means? Yes. Well, you give your opinion to the discussion. Yes. And what else might you do? Back at me. Yes, and you would bring some ideas, kind of that idea that um, look at different points of view, perhaps. A discussion might say on the one hand this, on the other hand that, because actually different countries will have completely different experiences. So a mountain range may be a really huge thing to enhance the development of one country let's say skiing and tourism, and yet for another country, it could really restrict your development. Yeah, can anyone think of a country where a mountain range, perhaps, or mountains might restrict development? Yes, good girl, nice. Okay, what about the next question? Who did the next question? Anyone to the next question? It is, Nobody, we'll just do the first one. To what extent does location affect the resource development of a country? Let's just deal with the word, to what extent? Okay, this is a really common word if you're doing IB Geo or Cambridge Geo. It's not something that's used very often in NCA. But what does to what extent mean? Who can tell me? What do you think that means? Yes. Oh my goodness, can you say that in a really loud voice so everybody can get because it was awesome? Right. Okay. So I've actually given you a um, very poor definition in comparison to that. <laughs> but it's discussing the degree of which something is important or not or whatever, okay? I suggest you go away and have a little play with those questions and think about, well, hey, what could that look like and feel like if you are planning an essay of the kinds of things that might come up? They're all kind of similar because they're kind of what I thought I'd, we might talk about. The second thing, I'm gonna skip over a video that I was gonna show you. There are 196 countries in the world. 25 of them are very rich. To find this kind of an average wealth per person of over $100,000 a year. They are. But far more countries are quite poor, and some, which we're considering here, are very, very poor. These are the 20 poorest countries in the world, where the per capita wealth is under $1,000 a year, or under $3 a day. Every country is now more or less on a path to growth, but the poor ones are growing very, very slowly. If Zimbabwe continues at its current growth rate, it will qualify as a rich country in 2,722 years. What we want to know in this film is why some countries prosper and others stagnate, so that we can understand what rich countries are doing right and get a better grip on the challenges and hurdles facing poor countries. There are basically three factors that determine whether a country will be rich or poor. The first is institutions. Institutions are beyond important. Broadly speaking, rich countries have good institutions and poor ones have very, very bad ones. The correlation between poverty and corruption is direct. The richest countries in the world are quite simply invariably also the least corrupt ones. And the most corrupt countries are also the poorest. When countries are corrupt, they can't collect enough taxes to get the good institutions they would need to escape the poverty trap. Half of the wealth of the world's poorest 20 countries goes into offshore accounts. Lost revenues in these countries totals between 10 and 20 billion dollars a year. Meanwhile, without an adequate tax base, poor countries can't invest in police, education, health and transport. Now, a more generous way to look at corruption is that it's really a case of clan-based thinking. Say you're hiring someone. In the rich countries, you're meant to do so simply on merit, interviewing lots of candidates, then picking the best one, irrespective of any personal connection. But in poor countries, under the sway of clan-based thinking, that approach would itself be seen as corrupt, 
it's your duty to disregard the so-called best candidate from an anonymous bunch in order to pick someone from your own team, your uncle, your brother, your second cousin, the guys from the same tribe. As a result, poor countries don't allow themselves access to the intelligence and talent of the whole population. There's a second thing that keeps countries poor, culture. What goes on in people's minds, their outlooks and beliefs. A striking statistic pops up here in relation to religion. If there's one generalization you can make about religion and wealth, it's that the less people believe, the richer they stand a chance of being. 19 of the richest countries in the world have 70% or more of their populations saying that religion is not at all important to them. The exception here is, unsurprisingly, the United States, which manages to combine great religiosity with huge wealth. More on that in a second. And conversely, the poorest nations in the world are also extremely believing ones. Here's how many people think religion and the supernatural is deeply important in the following countries. In the world's poorest country, simply everyone is a believer. Why is belief quite so bad for wealth creation? Because in general, religiosity is connected up with the idea that the here and now can't be improved. So you should focus on the spiritual and look forward to the next world instead. It makes quite a bit of sense when you live here. In the rich world, on the other hand, people are generally great believers in their capacity to alter their destiny through effort and talent. Incidentally, to explain the anomaly of the United States, religion seems not to slow down economic growth here because it's a particular sort of religion, an overwhelmingly Protestant and exceptionally materialistic kind. The American God doesn't want you to think of building the New Jerusalem in the next world. He wants it here and now, in Kansas or Houston. There's another big factor that determines the wealth and poverty of nations, geography. Poor countries are overwhelmingly located in the tropical regions. This isn't a coincidence. Life is, in many ways, simply far, far tougher there. The problems begin with agriculture. Tropical plants are generally a lot less packed with carbohydrates. Poor countries have worse soil too. Also, perhaps surprisingly, a tropical climate can be disadvantageous to photosynthesis. Historically, a key determinant in the likelihood of societies growing rich was their possession of large domesticated animals, such as horses and oxen, which liberated a huge part of the workforce from having to plow by hand. But in tropical Africa, Domesticated animals have throughout time been devastated by a further appalling scourge, the tsetse fly. This small fly, exclusively present in Africa because of its heat and humidity, knocks out animals on an enormous scale, making them sleepy or inactive, and has had a profound effect on the ability of Africans to develop technology, increase agricultural productivity, and amass wealth. It isn't just plants and animals that suffer in the tropics. In the middle latitudes, humans are open to a terrifying array of diseases, including 100% of low-income countries are affected by at least five tropical diseases simultaneously. The magical temperature, which has helped to make rich countries rich, is 16 degrees centigrade. However superficially unpleasant, that drop below 16 degrees as autumn starts to bite is quite literally a foundation stone of civilization. Geography also encompasses transport, and poor countries are on the whole very badly connected. Landlocked Bolivia and semi-landlocked Paraguay are the poorest nations in South America. Africa has only one major navigable river, the Nile, and hosts 15 landlocked nations, 11 of which have average incomes of $600 a year or less. Not coincidentally, the poorest country in Asia, Afghanistan, is also landlocked. Then there's the matter of natural resources. Natural resources like oil or precious metals can be real trouble, and paradoxically, poor countries tend to have them in spades. These natural resources are what economists call intensifiers. They will help to make a country with good institutions richer, but one with bad institutions get even poorer, precipitating what's called the resources trap. So the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the world's most mineral-rich countries, holding most of the world's coltan, which every mobile phone has a bit of inside. But natural resource wealth helps elites to grab money without requiring the cooperation of the whole society. If the only way to grow wealthy is to assemble high-tech aero engines, for example, you're going to need your whole society to buy into the project. But if you just need to extract a few minerals, you can do so with a small labor force, some guns, and an airstrip long enough to ferry your loot out to market. The wealth from Coltan keeps DRC armed rebels and guns and corrupts every level of society. 
So how should one weigh up the relative importance of all these different factors, institutional, cultural, and geographic, in determining the wealth of nations? There's no hard and fast rules, but as a guide, one can suggest that 50% of a nation's wealth comes down to the state of its institutions, 20% is due to its culture, and 10% each can be allocated to latitude, connectivity with the rest of the world, and geological good fortune. If you're a policymaker, this discussion has wide practical implications. But at a more personal level, one might take away two things from it. Firstly, modesty. You should have a better idea of what you owe your individual success to, which is not so much your own hard work or fine mind as the broader society you live in, which was produced over centuries and which you now draw benefit from unknowingly. At the same time, sympathy, an ability not to see failing societies just as basket cases, but rather as countries facing comprehensible and hugely difficult problems. Our sympathy can be enhanced by reflecting that the troubles of desperate lands are to a considerable extent to do with malaria, a lack of navigable river, and the horrific buzzing of the tsetse fly, rather than always some more intimate human failing, which we would ourselves never manifest. I'll show you that really simple chief thing here. About location, and to think about maybe that argument at the end about the role of geography, you might actually argue that it's actually much more important than that 30% they suggested. Um, so you might actually think perhaps it is something about the geography, perhaps it is more about the institutions, perhaps it is more about some other aspect. So I think it's kind of important. So, first thing. I wanted you to understand about command words. And we're coming quite late, so I'm going to zoom through one couple of sections. The next thing you have to be able to do is you have to be able to draw some diagrams. And I have an example of an activity which I think I'm just going to leave for you to do on your own. But drawing diagrams are really important. They can be anything that you think is important. You have to include some diagrams in your answers. These diagrams should be original or adapted. Original means you've made them up on the fly, in the moment, on the day, in the exam room. Okay? That's what the examiner is looking for. They're trying to see. Who can do that? To be resilient, to think about what might this look like? They could be adapted, which makes them original. So you might take an, an example of a diagram. Let's take the one that Mel showed us that I talked about, the one that kind of goes like this, yeah? And in that example, if you were looking at that, you might extrapolate into the future and perhaps say, well, maybe the world becomes a big, a much less um, connected in the future. Because there's a lot of discussion now about let's not travel, let's not fly, because of the impact that that's having on our environment and our carbon um, footprint. So maybe if you were doing this, you might draw your diagram like this and then perhaps predict in the future that it might actually change again. That's the kind of thing an examiner might look to see, see about that. Examiners hate it when people just copy a graph or a map or something from the resource. Okay? So don't do that. It should be appropriate to the answer. It should, not, it should be referred to in the text and not simply an add-on. So what I mean by that is is that you would say, figure one shows. Just like in your textbooks that you've got. Probably not in geo, but in other subjects you might have a textbook that says figure 326.421 says blah, blah, blah. And what it does is it takes your eye from the words to the diagram that you've drawn. And then back to the words again. Okay? So do try to do that. It shouldn't try and be too complex. So they might look like this. So this is a typical kind of diagram 
This is kind of like a poverty cycle that you might know of. A leads to B and so on. Or a flow diagram, X, Y, Z. Or, I, got, I was running out of ideas here, right? A, B, C. Yeah, the question. Uh, it could be, so if you think about this one, it could be words, they're not drawings, okay? So this one could be, let's say, climate change, increased use of um, carbon, fossil fuels, leads to um, rising sea levels, which leads to um, climate change migration, yeah? So something like that would work quite nicely, yeah? No, no, no. So you're just drawing maybe just this word, this word, this word. Yeah? Good question. They're not, they're not drawings, not pictures. Okay? Um, it could be a bar graph. Right? It could be something you take some letters, some numbers that you spread about in a resource booklet, and then you create a graph of some sort. Probably not that yet. Yeah. Um, it could be this, okay? These are the factors that are contributing to climate change migration or whatever it is, the development of a country. It could be, oh, just forget about that. So it could be anything like that. My suggestion to you would be to find a resource, anything, anything about geography. It could be a YouTube clip you watch, it could be a article you read, anything, and see if you can read the article and create a diagram from that article, which is actually what I've asked you to do on the next couple of pages. So I've taken a bit of an excerpt from an article, and I forgot to put the reference on, humble apologies, and I've asked you to try and read the article and create a diagram that relates to that. Um, so I suggest you do that yourselves because I think you're probably all a bit tired having been at school all day and working hard and then you're here in a lecture. I think you have a go at that. And yes, Mel forgot to suggest some, some um, various places to go to. Al Jazeera is a good site. Okay? Al Jazeera do some really great um, articles about things from a different perspective. <coughs> the Economist is a good, uh, good place to go for articles. It's a little bit tricky to do that online because you have to subscribe. I think you get about three a month or something like that, so you might have to head up to the library. On occasions, Nature, which is a scientific um, magazine, sometimes does some really nice articles. Um, sometimes you might go to The Guardian. It's also a really great location. Um, it's also free um, to get some articles about stuff that's happening across the globe. What have I missed, guys? Anything else? Is there anything else? Sometimes New Zealand Geographic. The BBC. BBC always. Okay. Not its bite-sized things, the BBC stuff. Um, sometimes, look, it's, it's, it's okay to watch a video, a YouTube clip. You know, all of those things help you to get kind of a bit of an understanding of, of the clip, of what you might be asked to look at. So my suggestion to you is read widely, listen to your teachers, enjoy it. Thank you. Said if you're going to email her, she needs a Gmail address. So make sure you give her that.